Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, we've got a very, very special guest. She is a four-time Olympic medalist, Olympic champion from the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Games. Today, we have the honor and privilege of sitting down and getting the perspective of Maya Dorado. Thanks. It's great to be here. really appreciate it. And uh, I thought you could offer a pretty unique perspective, um, especially in the time that we're in now being the, uh, the lead up to Olympic trials and the now 2021 Olympic games. Um, <clears throat> but I don't, I don't think I know this. Were you at Olympic trials in 2012? Yes, I did 2008, 2012 and 16. Okay. So you were, you were at three Olympic trials. I mean, yeah. briefly, what do you feel like you gained from those 08 and 12 experiences being in Omaha? It was hugely valuable to be able to go to those meets, even when I had no shot of making the Olympic team. Um, 2008 was, um, I think the first time they had done it in Omaha and the venue was just incredible. Um, I think I'd never been to a swim meet at that scale before where you have a huge arena, you have a, you know, a warm up pool in a completely different place. Um, you know, so, so that was one aspect of it. And then there's just the fact that I was at the meet with the, the best swimmers in the country. I distinctly remember one time when Michael Phelps got in um, my lane as I was warming down. And that was, you know, I, I can't remember how my races went, but I absolutely remember that moment. Um, and it's, it's really a swimming unlike any other. So I think being able to go in 08 and 12 and have sort of the exact same setup both times, you just get more and more comfortable in that environment. And you, you said you went to these meets having no shot. Um, I, I believe it in eight and 12. Did, <laughs> did you make it back at all? Did you get second swims? Yes. So in 2012, I got fourth in the 200 and 400 I am. Um, so <laughs> no I, had, shot. I certainly had a shot in that one. 2008 was a different story. Um, but I still felt like in 2012, um, I just wasn't quite ready to make the team, if that makes sense. And then certainly sort of comp- contrasting that with the preparation leading up to 2016, looking back at my preparation for 2012 kind of confirmed that, um, I, I really wasn't ready to do it. Even if the events had gone my way and things had worked out, it, I, it wouldn't kind of have been as meaningful as it was in 2016, where sort of all of these pieces just came together perfectly. Great answer, uh, because we are, we are getting into that preparation. That is why you're here. Um, so, so the next year, you make your first senior international team in world mm-hmm. championships, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, it was so um, Greg Meehan came over, came to the program in 2012. um, And then sort of through the training that year, um, we added a lot of distance, um, kind of just, just adjusted a few things in my training program. And then yeah, 2013 was a big breakthrough that summer uh, to make it to Barcelona. And I mean, obviously this is a big time frame, but you know, you go to world championships and then you have pan packs and then another world championships. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned that preparation. How do you feel like you were able to add the building blocks on year by year um, when prepping for those major international meets, especially 13 and 14, when you had the trials to qualify for them right before. Yeah. It's, it's incredibly helpful to go through sort of those versions of the qualifying meets, even though they're less intense than trials, you still have, um, you know, that pressure of getting, you have to see a a one or a two at world champ trials, or I think it's down to three for most events at, at, for pan packs. Um, And so just sort of like putting yourself in that mindset and switching from, I think as most swimmers do, it's about me and my best times and achievement to you know, getting into the mindset of, I really have to beat, you know, six other people in this heat in order to advance and do what I need to do. So 
that was incredibly helpful to go through and sort of get reps at that um, in both sort of coming from like periods of strength. Like I think 2013, um, I was, you know, really dialed in and clicking. 2014 had been a little bit of a tough year with transitioning from the collegiate team to sort of figuring out what professional swimming will look like for me. And I, I hadn't put together the best block of training leading up into pan pack trials and then pan packs. And so still being able to sort of figure out how can I make the best of it? What can I learn from each event? Um, and it was also a really valuable experience. And then, um, yeah, you, it, the 14 to 15 is an interesting year where you have, um, you know, you sort of qualify in advance and you just get to really focus on training leading up into 2015 worlds, which is, um, you know, both good and bad and that you don't have a meet to taper for a little bit earlier, but it also kind of takes some of that pressure off in that year. Yeah. And so then with, with that under your belt heading into 2016, you know, uh, in May, or I guess was, was Santa Clara in June that year, early June, and then trials were late June of 2016. I want to say that Santa Clara was a little bit earlier because I think the Atlanta Classic was the last meet. Maybe I'm confusing those, but I think Atlanta Classic was the last meet that we did before uh, trials. Okay. So, so having had those, those years of prep and like you said, getting those reps in, Mm -hmm. um, how are you feeling heading into 16, knowing that you've been to trials, knowing that you've done this trials big meet process before, but also knowing that you are a real contender now. Yeah, it was a totally different experience. Um, uh, every, I think I remember as soon as we got to the first meet, it was like a November pro swim series in Minneapolis in 2015. It just felt different. The, the atmosphere on the deck felt more intense. Everybody was a little bit more on edge and you could just tell like, we're, this is coming into an Olympic year. So coming to terms with that and just realizing that this was going to be just a really emotionally intense year and figuring out how to stay steady, still get the training done that you need to do, still be able to deal with the ups and downs that are inevitably going to come, even if you're training as best as you've ever done. Um, And just sort of, I think I came to terms with it at that meet that it was going to be, you know, at a pretty, pretty high level for, for the next, uh, you know, eight or so months or whatever it was at that point. And so I had a really good kind of series of pro swim meets that year leading up to it, which was really helpful in um, developing confidence, especially in the 200 backstroke, which was sort of this new event that had popped up for me. Um, Just getting reps in of doing multiple events, kind of, you know, uh, working through that fatigue. And then through my swimming career, I had always been just absolutely terrible um, at swimming well in sort of mid-season meets. And I was really only ever able to summon my best efforts when I absolutely had to. I'm so glad that that changed because at Santa Clara, a few months before trials, I was able to throw down like a very respectable 200 freestyle, even though I wasn't planning on swimming that at trials. And then, you know, one thing led to another and that ended up getting me on a night relay. So sort of at the very last months of my swimming career, I was able to pull out a good mid-season meet um, and was all the better for it. But the Atlanta Classic actually was not a particularly good meet for me. Um, But I think at that point, you just have to be comfortable in the training, not let anything kind of sway you too much one way or another. Because at this point, like a month before trials, really the cake is basically baked. And so there's not a whole lot that you want to be changing at this point. There's not a lot of second guessing that you're able to do. Like the the training is done. And so just making sure that you can be confident and as calm as you can possibly be at this point is really the key going into these last few weeks. Uh, A a couple interesting points I want to hit on there. Uh, The mid-season swims, getting better at those, was that something you were mindful about heading into this season or did that just kind of come with your training being as it was at that point? Yeah, I think that just kind of came from like, 
becoming more of a professional in the sport, if that makes sense, where this is what I was doing full time. Um, there were valuable things that I could learn at each meet and each swim. Um, and so to take advantage of that, you have to sort of, you know, rise up to the occasion, even if it's not the very last meet of the year. So I just got better at summoning better efforts throughout the year so that I could get better data and feedback to incorporate into um, the training program. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you said that at that November meet in 2015, you had had this realization of, all right, this, this year is going to be a little more intense. Um, mm-hmm. And I have to, and, and I have to try to learn how to stay calm through the ups and downs. Do you remember having any specific ups and downs in that next five or six months and, and kind of learning how to deal with those? Yeah, I had, um, I mean, I, I, will preface this by saying like I had a very smooth journey that last year and like basically everything went right um which I'm very grateful for because that timing like that's not guaranteed you could get sick you get in in and there's nothing really that you can do about it so um my one kind of big question mark throughout that year I had a really bad lower back and that um sort of just all sorts of tension and tightness in the hips and the lower back. And that mostly manifested in my ability to do breaststroke, which was already my worst stroke in the IM. And, you know, I I already had problems with it. And then I just had a lot of days where like, I couldn't do that motion really well, or even really train very much breaststroke kick, um, because my hips and groin would get really tight. And so we just had to learn sort of how to work around that and how to get quality over quantity. Um, but, but it's stressful because you feel like if I'm not able to prepare as much as I feel like I need to, especially in my weakest stroke, like, am I going to be ready for this moment? Um, and so, you know, credit to Greg for putting together still really solid 400 IM sets that weren't, you know, making me do 200s or 300s of breaststroke, but instead just like really focusing on the quality of it and the transition and then also having amazing physical therapists and, um, you know, massage therapists that were able to sort of like get me through at, at, you know, enough, um, capacity to, to be able to train when I needed to. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds like a big stressor, but, (laughs) but also, like you said, you were able to get through it. We obviously know, know how it resulted. Um, so going into that taper, yeah, obviously taper is a time where you're sitting around a lot more. You have a lot more time to think nerves can kind of come out. Um, mm-hmm. Can you, can you take me through how you were able to manage that process of, all right, we're resting for like, for the big show. Um, mm-hmm. how, how do I handle myself mentally? Oh, there are so many elements of that that were like difficult or interesting. So the first was, um, I I remember just like falling asleep at night, trying not to think about trials. And as soon as I did, my heart rate would just jump up to like 120 beats per minute. And I could just like feel it in my head. And I was like, I need to sleep. I'm tired, but I'm also really stressed about this. So um, that those nerves were there and they were there like months leading up to trials. I think in January, I would start thinking about it and like getting those nerves. Um, So yeah. (laughs) I'm um, very excited to watch this year. I'm not super sad that I don't have to go through that again. Um, and then the second kind of interesting thing is that as a 400 IMer, you know, I need a little bit more training and base. I wasn't lifting super heavy, partly because of my back. And so there wasn't a lot that I needed to come down from in the weight room. Um, and then coupled with the fact that like, you know, I had a really good shot to make the team. Um, I think it was probably like me, Simone didn't do full tapers, um, because, you know, we were, Greg was fairly confident. I had my ups and downs, but like, you know, like there's a really reasonable expectation that I'm going to need to do another big 400 IM in five to six weeks after trials. So we can't fully come down all the way for it. And so in some ways that actually was kind of nice and that you still have enough kind of heart rate stuff. You have enough fatigue to like 
take some of those nerves off and cool that edge in the taper leading up to trials. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was actually quite helpful. And I was very grateful for the fact that I still had to do, you know, fairly good training sets leading up to it. Cause if it was like full taper and you just get in, float around and get out, like, while I claim that I would have liked that, it actually, I think would have made things a little more harder if you can't kind of get that um, fatigue, which I think calms us swimmers down a little bit. That totally makes sense. Uh, I've never put that, those specific pieces together of like, Oh, I'm a little more tired. That makes it a little more easy to, to sleep and, and relax a little bit, mm-hmm. which yeah, but that seems <laughs> great. Um, so, so heading to trials, I mean, I've, I've said this before on many podcasts, um, as, as a member of the media, even you walk into that building and you feel the tension. Um, it's just, it's, it's a totally different environment. Um, so, so starting with sleep, I don't, do you sleep at Olympic trials? Because it seems like it seems an impossible task to me. Um, fortunately, yes. So in the, but also luckily the 400 I am was on the first day. So, um, even if you get there and you can't really sleep, like it's, it's not the worst thing in the world, but yeah, I was, I was able to get pretty good night's sleep leading up to it. Um, I think I even got in a nap during the break between prelims and finals on the day of the 400 I am. Um, but then that night afterwards, like there was no sleep. I was way too tired. Um, <laughs> and so like, and I'm someone who even now I, you know, I'm not, I work out, but like, I'm not super athletic. If I don't get nine hours of sleep, I'm pissed. Um, and I'm like, I, that worries me. Um, yeah. d- you know, being in a big meet like that, knowing you have two more events left, d- how do you deal with, with, the having the excitement of not being able to sleep and and then going into the next day or the day after knowing, okay, I have to still have to perform. Yes. Um, one very much resonate with eight hours of sleep minimum per night, or I'm a nightmare. Um, but I will say the, the joy and the relief of making the Olympic team is far exceeds any sort (laughs) of, um, you know, loss of performance that you might suffer from only getting four or five hours of sleep. So, I was, it was totally fine, like slept it off. And then you just feel on cloud nine and you're kind of in that spot where like it, everything is gravy. We're, we're going to be okay. Okay. So that, that, uh, that's, that seems good. That's, that's an easy (laughs) fix. Um, so you make the team three events and then there's this weird six week period where it's kind of, you're kind of training, you're kind of double tapering. Um, Mm -hmm. can you talk to me about that period? And especially once you get to training camp with team USA, what that Mm -hmm. environment is like. Yeah. So they've changed, they've kind of played around with the structure of trials to home to camp. And in some years you just had to go straight from Olympic trials to camp. And that was just a lot of, you know, people weren't able to like fully come down off the emotional high of trials. So now we got to go home for maybe six days, I think, after trials, which is already, you know, a grueling eight day meet with semifinals. And so you're like, great, I've done one, but I have an even bigger one coming up. So it was really nice to get sort of back to normalcy, even just for a few days, um, come home, kind of get your life together before you go. I distinctly remember practices with um Leah and Simone after we got back while we were just kind of training here for a few days, trying to get back up into shape and ramp our volume up. And we were like, it's not worth it. Like we're in so much pain. Like I don't want to go anymore. I think that was some of the hardest um, you know, practices that that we did, um, trying to come back up into shape after after trials. So tried to get our base back underneath us before we left for camp. And then once you're at camp, it just feels, it's, it's a dream. Um, you know, you're, you're at Olympic camp, you're with the best swim team in the country and everybody is just so overjoyed to be there. So relieved that trials is behind you, um, that it, it feels, it was so much fun. Um, you know, people get to watch each other and it's just such a great environment on the pool deck. Um, every day it was it was really a blast I remember for our open practice in San Antonio like 4,000 people showed up to watch 
a Saturday morning practice, which was kind of the first time that you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is what the Olympics is. Cause you've been on teams with these people before you've done training camps for worlds and such, but nobody really cared about that. And now <laughs> you kind that was sort of my first sign of like, this is, this is going to be different. Um, and it was, it was really special. Do you remember that Saturday morning practice that you guys did? Um, I do because it was actually probably my worst practice <laughs> that I had throughout training camp. Like Greg was in charge of kind of like the 200 group with like some hundreds of stroke thrown in there. And so they were doing this really fun, like 50, 50s at 200 pace of stroke, which I was like, that sounds amazing. Why can't I do that? And I was put in with Connor Yeager and Jordan Wilmowski doing like 2100 <laughs> terribly and they um they did some of the like mic'd up coach sessions and that was the day that they mic'd up Greg and so like you can hear on some of these videos that they did like me just whining so hard on the side of the pool like, so I think I ended up having to put fins on to finish it it was not my best but um, we kept those to a minimum, fortunately, throughout training camp. It just happened to be the day that 4,000 people were watching. So, so along those lines, <laughs> I have to wonder, you, obviously, you know, if, if you talk to any, anyone from the U.S., they'll say like Olympic trials is the big pressure meet and then kind of the Olympics is, is like almost less pressure in some ways mm -hmm. um, or for a lot of people. But you're still kind of tapering. It's a really big meet. Uh, do you get worried if you do like these long sets for you, especially when you're swimming events like you are, you know, you mentioned, well, I don't have to come down as much, but if you're doing like real training, do you ever get worried that like, oh my God, like, how am I going to taper? How am I going to be rested and ready to go? Um, I mean, at, at that point, having as many years as I'd had with Greg, having the success that, that we had had, like I, I trusted the process pretty well. And um, you just learn to kind of communicate well about how you're feeling and kind of heart rate is a good indicator of like relative exertion and, you know, just sort of like how you're recovering and getting through it. And all of the signs were pointing to like, this is fine. You know, like I'm, I'm popping when I need to have kind of pop your up-tempo days. I'm able to handle the yardage when we have that. And just kind of like everything was doing okay and at that point it was like I'm on the Olympic team it's fine like <laughs> we're, we're gonna be okay tips are gonna land where they fall <laughs> yep um okay so so I've got a couple bigger questions for you one is kind of as you said this year went extremely smoothly for you I, I think if if someone were to make a graph of your career it, it'd basically just be this right I mean you 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 started um, especially your international career, you just kept building and building and building. Um, I for a bit. Oh, sorry, yeah. I got you at the no at the upward trajectory. <laughs> so, so it seemed like your inter on your international career, you just kept building and building and building. Um, mm -hmm. From a mental standpoint, for you, do you is there anything particular or or things you can point to to attribute that to to just the success you were able to keep having? And, and not sort of have a down period necessarily, at least on the international stage, um, mm -hmm. those last four to six years of your career? Hmm. Um, if I had a super clean or easy answer, I would be a much better coach. Um, <laughs> no, I just, I, it's really hard to say. It's like, um, some of it is like building on itself. And so I feel very fortunate that I kind of hit this kind of steady upward trajectory later in my career. Um, you know, because if I had had to try to sustain that for eight years or 10 years, that's a lot harder to always have improvements. I think keeping it to like 13, 14, 15, 16 is a little bit more manageable. Um, and just like continuing to get new experience, um, just sort of like not expecting too much too soon and sort of, 
letting the career evolve a little more naturally and sort of seeing how I'm able to progress, I think really helped. Um, and then just like being able to switch up events, you know, the first thing I qualified for, for the 2013 world championship team was the 200 fly. And then I stopped doing that. I think I did that at pan packs, but didn't do anything else besides the IMs at 2015 worlds. And so I was like always able to kind of bring in new events and things that I needed to focus on. And so that was able to keep the training a little more fresh. Um, but I don't have a super clear explanation as to why. I think one more thing that really made a difference was, so 13, 14, 15, and then knowing that 2016 was my last year was incredibly helpful for me um, because I was able to give absolutely everything knowing that it was confined to um, a certain period of time. And that after that, I wouldn't have to, and wouldn't get to do it again, really helped me sort of like, give everything to that final year. I remember you saying that then I'm glad you've stuck to your guns now, <laughs> extremely sad for swimming fans, but makes a lot of sense for you. Um, you said, you said you would be a really good coach. Do you coach now at all? No, <laughs> no, I, um, I like kind of talking shop with Greg and Tracy uh, occasionally and just kind of, you know, hearing how the team is doing and, and what they're thinking, but no, no coaching in my future. Hmm. You say that now and we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so heading into this 2021 Olympic trials, uh, we'll close out with this. Um, you know, if you were, if you were to, to give the younger swimmers, um, heading into this Olympic trials, any, any perspective, any words of wisdom for you, um, mm. what would you tell them? Yeah, I think one expect the nerves. Like, even if you don't get really nervous at other meets, you will get nervous at Olympic trials and that's a good thing. Use it to your advantage, but just don't, don't freak out or think that something's wrong. If you're feeling an inordinate amount of pressure at this meet because it is incredibly stressful. Um, the second thing that I would offer is that I found the sort of one or two or no go a really stressful way to think about it and being like, you know, I can't control what everybody else in this heat does that that's sort of like they hold my Olympic destiny like, in their hand, sort of like a tiny bird. And that was really hard for me to let go of. But then I realized that it still doesn't really fundamentally change anything. You have to swim your race still, you have to touch the wall. And at the end of the day, you still cannot control what those other people do. And so if you go best time and you get third, fourth or fifth, like you've hopefully done enough throughout the process that you feel comfortable walking up to the blocks before you even know the outcome. And once I was able to, not that I was a, you know, a pillar of calm or like great perspective at trials. Cause I was also incredibly nervous, but basically the only way I was able to even get out to the blocks in that 400 IM final and like barely hang on to my sanity was remembering that. And, you know, having that perspective that it's, it's just a 400 IM like I always do. I feel so confident in my training that I'm going to do the best I can and whatever happens, happens very much easier said than done but i think that's the only way to get through it without um you know a complete breakdown <laughs> gotta let that little bird fly <laughs> exactly uh, well maya thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and perspective uh hopefully we'll get to talk to you again but um again appreciate you being on here would love to it was really great to chat coleman You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.